Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark Hutton. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Your eminences, honored guests, community members, and friends. What an extraordinary evening tonight. Doing what we have become better at in our community, and that is celebrating the real contributions of serious people. We weren't always as good, but we have learned, and I couldn't be more proud of the representation of all of you tonight to honor someone so special as Tonner. A great deal has been said tonight. I will repeat some of it, I will correct some of it, and I will say a few more things to try to give a flavor of who this Tonner Akjan is. Not the man he's become, but the path he took to get there. Now, as a child growing up in Los Angeles, I grew up, as I told Robert Morgenthau once uh, a number of years ago, in the shadow of Ambassador Morgenthau's story. So many of us did. One of my earliest memories is as a child carrying the candle with the survivor to break ground on the Armenian Genocide Memorial, the first on public soil in the United States, in Montebello, California. You can do the math, it was a long time ago. And my mother had uh, met a young scholar at UCLA, uh, his name has been invoked tonight already, Richard Ovanesian, and uh, they became friends, we all became friends, and uh, my mother uh, edited Richard's first book, Song of the First Republic. Uh, and so this has been a part of my life uh, for as long as I can remember. But for someone like Tanner and so many who grew up in Turkey, it is not the same story. The Armenian Genocide was not taught in the schools. There were whispers in the community. People remembered in the villages which houses were inhabited by whom and where the ghost lay. But that systematic education didn't exist in those days. And so for someone like Tanner to come to the place he is today was not a foregone conclusion but it speaks to a growth, something that was, there was a seed in his life as he saw it. And if his, his sense of, of challenge and correctedness and democracy didn't find its first expression in his support of the Armenians. As a matter of fact, and what hasn't been mentioned tonight, but there's a wonderful photo in the booklet where Tanner looks very young, because he was young once, and very serious, he is at a rebel meeting when he was working with the Kurdish resistance back in the 1970s. Working with Ocalan and others to try to bring change in a different way to Turkey, always understanding that something had to change in his home country for true democracy and a real future to be built. And that cost him, he found himself imprisoned, and in another story that only he can tell, he somehow made his way out of that prison. They didn't open the doors, he found a way out. And he made his way to Europe, where he then followed his pursuit in education. But part of what happened there is that he realized that change can come in one of two ways. It can come violently, as in the resistance, or it can come by changing the beliefs of people through serious academic work that brings the truth out in the open. And this is the path that Tonner chose at that very, very significant transition point in his life. And it's an important one. But the key is the origins of this feeling were always in bringing about a better Turkey. In believing that there was, that his homeland deserved better. And this, I think, has always been at the core of what motivates him to take the risks he takes and to do the work he's done. Because with Tanner, it was never about worrying about the risks. It was about the purpose, it was about the impact, it was about the intent. And then the path itself developed as life unfolded. And so he was a student in Germany, in Hanover, and he completed a PhD, and the Armenian Genocide became one of those topics. Now, I didn't know Tanner then, I only know what he told me, because when he did come to us in the United States, we asked a lot of questions. 
Now, how did that happen? Vartan mentioned a little of it, but let me take you back a little further. Some of you remember an extraordinary film, a documentary called A Wall of Silence. And this was made by a Dutch filmmaker, and it was the story of the meeting, the first meeting, between Taner Akjan and Vahak and Adrian. And Vahakin's name has been mentioned, but he is a very significant scholar of the Armenian Genocide, one of the first to really publish on the legal aspects using German sources that lay the groundwork for so much work to come and that influenced Tanner. And they had never met, but their work spoke to each other. And it took this Dutch filmmaker who knew Tanner and who knew Vahakin to bring them together. That was an act of courage on both of their parts. And that was something that really, this is in the 90s, that really changed the tone. And some of you may remember seeing that documentary when it first came out. Very, very impactful. And so they developed a friendship and an admiration. They shared libraries and books, and both of them have extraordinary libraries. And then one day, as Vartan mentioned, Dennis got a call out in the blue from his friend, Vahakin Dadrian. Dennis, yes, Vahakin, how are you? Dennis, and Vahakin cut right to the chase, never one for stories. You must bring Taner to the United States. And he said, as our daughter mentioned, why? Do you really think the Armenian community would understand? But he also said, Vahakin knows something here. He has been working on this. And if Vahakin says this is important, I will take the chance. And so for that, Dennis, a round of applause to you for having the courage to do that. The way paths falls, we look back now, it seems so clear that would have unfolded this way. But as we all look back at our own lives, how many decisions at how many points might things have gone a different direction? Might there have been a missed opportunity? Might what developed not have developed in that way? So that was a key moment. Vahakin's call and Tanner coming. Now, no, he didn't live with us for two years, but it felt like that. <laughs> he was with us all the time, just for a couple weeks. Um, and I remember when Tanner was with us, and this is now the year 2000. The world is a very different place. The Armenian world is a very different place. This is a time when we've seen the collapse of the Soviet Union. We've seen the emergence of a new Republic of Armenia, but it's still in crisis and in chaos and in darkness, recovering from an earthquake and from war. This is a very different time. The border's been closed with Turkey. This was not a time when Armenians were friends with the Turks. So this was a very important moment. And I remember Dennis saying to Tanner, you know, Tanner, they think that you're a spy. Yeah. Why else, this just speaks to us, right? Why else would you study the Armenian genocide if you didn't have an atelier motive? But of course, that turned out not to be true and Tanner laughed it off as he always did. And he said no, and I asked him, I said, so tell me why do you study this topic that is creating tension for you in your own country? And I'll never forget what he told me and he reminded me there or taught me there something that I had never understood, and that is that the story of the Armenian Genocide, which we all think of as our history, is also Turkish history. And is as important in the Turkish historians and for Turkish history as it is for us. Because it had an impact just as profound, perhaps not in the disruption of people, but in the destruction of a future or a possible future for a democratic country that is still unfolding even today in fits and starts and in some areas now of some real, um, some, some real lack of optimism. But in that moment, Tanner said to me, he said, you know, he said, the only way Turkey can become democratic is, and become its best self is if it faces its history if it faces its psychological taboos. And he named five of them. I can't remember the other four. He'll tell you. But the one, the first, he said, is the Armenian Genocide. And until the Turks come to acknowledge what is their history and ours, 
They will never be free to be an open society because they will always have something to hide at the core of their birth. Because it was in the emergence and the birth of that Republic of Turkey in 1921 on the heels of the Armenian Genocide with the wealth of the Armenians and so much more that all of you in this room know. And so that lie is part of the founding, it is the dark stain of Turkish history. And until it faces it, then Turkey will never be able to be democratic. We are seeing that play out in the moments when it has come closer and then fallen back and then come closer, tantalizingly close there were some years where it was, where it looked like we were moving in the right direction, where Hudan Dink was doing the work that he was doing, where works like my grandmother were coming out and people all across Turkey. Remember those days? Seems like a long time ago. We're remembering the Armenian origins, that so many in Turkey had Armenian grandmothers. This was a very profound moment that might have led to a certain outcome. But again, the choices that were made turned it from a path of possibility to a path that we can all say today is something of darkness. And so when Tanner came to Detroit, when we spent those time together, we learned about that Sherlock Holmes, great, great way to describe him, of uh, the Armenian Genocide. And how did he do it? I remember him talking about there were all of these young scholars. Tucker has this network, this web. I imagined a web sort of spread all around Turkey where they would go into the archives in different ways at different times to ask for random documents where they couldn't ask for the same documents. You didn't want the same person asking for too many of similar kind of documents because then they figured out they were trying to do something. So we had to have a multitude of people asking for different documents in randomized ways that they were then brought together so that he could then see the total because you had to fool the authorities. Very hard thing to do. The other thing he did as part of this slew thing was pulled together all of the war crimes trials documents if you remember that and again we've all lived with his publication which appeared in turkey of the war crimes trials following the armenian genocide but those had disappeared they were published back in the day and they had disappeared and so he had to bring them all together and before he could publish them i'll never forget this um, Dennis at the Research Center put together a Xerox copy of the uh, War Crimes Trials documents. And you know who was his first customer? $250. This is going back about, what, 15 years now? It's Dr. Stanford Shaw. Some of you might know him from UCLA. He bought those, and he was the first owner of Tanner's work in Turkey at that time. Of course, it came out later in multiple languages and has had extraordinary impact ever since. And the scholars have already spoken about some of the other work. Um, there are books, by the way, on the table, and let me just say this, just as a quick aside. When I leave tonight, I don't want to see a book on that table. If you support Tanner's work, you will buy a book. And if you're, you already have a copy, buy one for your friends, buy them for your children, but buy them. Because scholars live in part on their work, and it's important to support them. So let's not send the books home with him. All right, just as a public service announcement, make sure you do that. Um, so, so Tonner's career then started to develop. As I said, there were moments when there looked like possibility. Tonner would go back and visit Turkey, and we would worry every time he went what would happen. Remember what we were, um, we all know where we were when we learned about Van Dink, close friend of Tanner's, and they had been together not much before he was assassinated. And so we worried a great deal. So Tanner, somehow the angel is smiling on you and keeping you safe, knowing that you have great work to do and yet to do still. Um, it's, uh, as we think about that path from University of Michigan Dearborn to the University of Michigan, and then on to Minnesota, another wonderful man, a scholar uh, who headed the uh, Institute for Genocide and Holocaust Studies at the University of Minnesota, Steve Einstein, brought Connor there where he could continue his work here in the United States. By then, his English was pretty good. When he came in 2000, he didn't speak much English. As a matter of fact, it was Dennis's sister, Yeritskin Rosalie, 
who taught him English. They would have their sessions because Dennis said, you have to learn English if you're going to be able to be successful and really tell the story on the world stage and what you're doing deserves the world stage. Connor, ever the dutiful student, as well as the extraordinary teacher, studied hard, learned his English. And it was then when we first met Helene, who came as a child, and say, and I, I, the, the global connection of people, I'll never forget Helene, how you and our daughter Ani didn't speak, didn't share a language in common, and yet you were communicating like only two children can do. So it's wonderful to see you here celebrating tonight. Um, then finally to Clark and the extraordinary work that we're seeing today. This work is work, as we all know, that takes with it a great deal of courage. It is inspirational. But the wonderful thing about Tonner, as I've said, it was never about him. It was never about the accolades. Tonner would actually be more comfortable going through life without all the accolades we're giving him. He is a truly humble man who is doing the work because it's the right work to do, because the story has to be told, because truth still is the foundation for building a just and honest society. And when you do things for the right reasons, good things happen. And so it is our obligation as a community to say thank you. But it's not a thanks he's seeking. What we all hope for, though, is a continued support so that he can continue to build and be an inspiration to students like Hachi and Umit and so many others who will be the next generation of scholars, not just in the fineness of the work they do. The perspective of a historian and a sociologist together is actually a very special one. Historians look at details, they look at archives, and they try to understand the stories in those archives, and Tonner does that very well. But the sociologist lives in the, today, thinks of the impact on societies and culture. And that's really what pulls Tonner, I think it's his sociological background, that pulls him from this history into being that engaged member of the community, thinking about the impact of this work on how to build a real society, a society in which all who live within it can be respected, can, can trust each other, can live together in peace and harmony. And so this other turkey, this good turkey, may be hidden today. It seems to have taken a bit of a dark path, maybe a U-turn, we hope. But we hope that one day the foundation that people like Tonner have built which continues to be a belief that the truth is possible, will somehow emerge. Because history takes twists and turns that we can't predict. Very few in this room could have predicted that the Soviet Union would have fallen the way it did. Very few of us growing up knew there would be an independent and free Republic of Armenia. We hoped so, we dreamt so, but we didn't know so. And if we're honest with ourselves, we were as surprised as anyone that it came to pass. But think for a moment about the work that Tanner is doing on the Armenian Genocide and the impact of that work on the health and potential of the current Republic of Armenia. When people say it's a past story, it's 100 plus years ago, only historians do it, what's the implication for today? We all know there is an implication for today. And why is that? Because think about the Republic of Armenia, and many of us come and go a great deal, and we've been through a revolution recently, but we know that its future is still very much in doubt, despite the extraordinary energy and intelligence and passion of this independence generation. And why? Because it has a closed border with Turkey, and it's still in a sometimes hot war with Azerbaijan. And what's the common link there? The Armenian Genocide. The truth. When Turkey can find a place to acknowledge it and to start to look at its better history and not this blight on its history, it will no longer fear the Republic of Armenia or the Armenians coming down from Yerevan to Van to see their old homes, to perhaps buy a farm, to do what they want, to be part of Western Armenia. 
and so the work that could lead, we hope one day, to recognition and to understanding and to peace will also create more harmony in a place in the world that has not always seen it, that can give possibility for a future for Armenia. There's an old phrase, of course, that um, we all hear in this country. It was uh, uh, used often by Martin Luther King Jr. The arc of history, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And I believe we have to still believe that. It bends toward justice, but it doesn't bend on its own. It bends because there are great men and women, people like Tanner Akcham, who are willing to put their sweat, their intellectual power, their courage, risk their own lives, in a real sense, to force that bending and to say, yes, the truth will out, whatever you think, because it is right, because it is just, and because it speaks to all of us. So, Tanner, thank you for all you've done. Extraordinary person, a great friend, and who knows, maybe one day a Nobel Prize winner. Thank you.